trying to tell me? Somebody was yelling. Hi, right. I'm, I'm an ESL you. teacher here. Um, just, I don't, I don't think have my ESL parents, but if anybody needs Spanish translation, let me know. I'll also be walking around, so if anybody needs help, <laughs> I'll just raise your hand and I'll be walking around as well. Okay? Just bug Mr. Murray for help. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> so sorry, with the screen not frozen, with the screen not frozen, once you are signed in, if you go to the top of whatever browser you're using, there'll be a plus button that allows you to open up a new tab. Up in the address bar is where you want to type that address. So tinyurl.com slash mustangparent. All right, or if you don't want to type, I did put it on the Governor Mifflin website under uh, One to World, which is a link across the top. All right, if you need help getting logged in, let us know and we'll help you getting logged in. And then we'll talk through some of these different things. So, let's talk through some of this and then we'll continue to try to help you. This presentation will stay forever. I did link it on the One to World website, which some of you may have never gone to. But if you go to Governor Mifflin's website, all right, um, at the top of the Governor Mifflin website, there are links going across the top, like where it says high school, middle school, intermediate school. You guys are familiar with that area? So as I come across, all the way to the right is the One to World website. All right. uh, if you're not familiar with this, when the Chromebook initiative began, um, Dr. Hess was actually kind of leading the charge at that time. That was before I was even here at Mifflin. Um, she really wanted to look at like, how these devices were connecting us to the world, not just being a supplemental piece of paper. 
and without getting into too deep of a conversation, she went with the term one to world, because it was really about like, how are these devices comparing our kids for the real world, not necessarily just transferring worksheets and doing some of those things like that. Right? As we both know, sometimes it is transferring worksheets and doing things like that. Just like in our day-to-day -day lives, sometimes we're typing things instead of writing them out, because that's probably more realistic to our lives. All right? But just to give you an idea where that was from. So if you click on One to World, I do have it linked there. Uh, so right over here, G Suite for Parents, and that will take you to that slideshow as well. There are links throughout the slideshow that you can go back to later on um, when you have time, if you'd like to, or if you remember me saying something, you can go back to it at that point. All right, does everybody have that link? I think you can find it later on. If not, we can probably even email it out then, and, you know, put that out as a, as a distribution as we go through. Uh, so a little bit about myself. My name is Rick Lappy. I'm the instructional technology coach here at the district. Um, so my role is basically to kind of teach teachers, but also teach students. So in, my, in the root of my goal is to support students by helping teachers, by helping administrators, um, by helping whoever, whatever stakeholder it is, all right, um, including school board members if they would so present itself, all right, or, you know, some of you as community members um, or the, you know, the PTO or whatever it may be. Uh, this is my third year now at Governor Mifflin. I was at Wilson before that. I know, boo. <laughs> Don't, be, don't get too hard on me. I was a Wilson alumni as well, all right? I guess it just took me a really long time to grow up, so if you want to make more husband comments, you know, as you probably say about your own husband, uh, you know, it takes us, it takes us a while to grow up sometimes, and I guess I found the light at one point. Um, so contact information's on there. The other thing to point out, um, Governor Mifflin, if you haven't followed them on Facebook or Twitter, there's a lot of stuff being posted out on Facebook and Twitter. If you're completely against social media, or at least creating an account on social media, you can still look at stuff on Twitter. So like if I click on this hashtag MifflinSD, teachers throughout the district will post things that are happening in the classroom. So as a parent, and just to give you a little bit of a, more background, I do have two students in the district. Uh, my daughter is in ninth grade, Annabella, and my son Jameson is in fifth grade. So I'm not only an employee, but I'm also a parent. Um, so I like to, see some of the things that happen in school with them. Just like you, if I asked them at dinner how was school today, they'd say fine. And if I asked them what they learned about today, they typically say nothing, all right? If I do ask probing questions, like what was your favorite part of the day, all right, and make them answer those open-ended questions, it usually goes a lot further. Um, and through some of these tools we've talked about, you might even be able to get deeper probing questions to hopefully stimulate that conversation. So as you scroll through here, you'll see different stuff posted by all different teachers throughout the district, all right? And you don't need an account on Twitter to even follow these. You can just click on that link and see what's there. It didn't click on it, it didn't go when you clicked on it? The Twitter link? Did it yell at you or did it just kind of stay where it was? It's blocked, oh, because you're on guests. It's probably blocked on Twitter. If you're on the guest account, so not on a Chromebook, it's probably blocking you from going to that site. All right. All right, so if you click back, it'll take you back to where you are. Um, feel free to check that out when you're at home. All right, so plan for this evening, talk a little bit about Chromebooks. Um, introduction slash work through Google Drive, uh, G Suite for Education, creating, sharing, and collaborating, uh, and then Skyward, all right? We can also move in whatever direction we want to go, but this is kind of what we advertise we cover, and I think that seems to be what the majority of people are looking to go through. So I keep referencing this Chromebook, and some of you brought it um, along, brought your son or daughters along, some of you might have them at home. So if we really look at a Chromebook, they're just laptops, aren't they? Kind of, sort of, not really, all right? So they're not necessarily a laptop. Uh, they're maybe a little less, and in my mind, maybe a little more, all right, because it works in different ways. So a Chromebook is basically a standalone device that runs off the Chrome operating system. The big difference between a traditional laptop and a Chromebook is that a Chromebook, you do not install programs onto the device. 
So nothing on the Chromebook is installed. Everything is web-based. With that being said, it does have offline access. So if your kids come home and they're like, oh, our internet's out, I can't do any work. If they can turn it on, they can do things like create a Google Doc, which is like a Microsoft Word document, create a slideshow, which is like a PowerPoint, all right? create a Google Sheet, which is like an Excel file, and then there's a whole bunch of other offline things they can do. So don't let that be an excuse for them not doing work, all right? or even on a plane. If you're going on vacation and you so choose to be that mean parent and make them do work when you're on vacation and you're on the plane and you don't want to spot some money, they can still be working on some of those files. All right? So the Chromebook, standalone device that runs uh, most efficiently off the web, just like, a, uh, like an iPad would be, all right, um, aren't able to install programs. Big advantage of not being able to install programs is you don't get viruses. So you can imagine in a school setting how nice that is. All right? So you're avoiding that students downloading stuff they're not supposed to have. My parents, who are in their 70s, and I love them dearly, but I know if I would have gotten my dad a laptop, I would have been going over nonstop all right, and fixing whatever he downloaded and the viruses he got. So back and forth a little bit, they ended up buying a Chromebook. All right? Two months later now, they love it, they're happy. Really, all they do is go on Facebook, check their email, and do web-based stuff anyway. So they really didn't need like a fancy laptop. They weren't installing games that they wanted to play or doing anything crazy along those lines. All right. So every student in the district they get a Chromebook, um, as you're familiar with, and they're a great price point, and they allow students to do the majority of what we would allow them want them to do. All right. As far as learning goes, does that make sense for what a Chromebook is? Any questions on that? You guys got to help me out. I need some gauge. Good. All right. Good. So how do we log in? Um, as you notice, if you're on a Chromebook, it's going to automatically log you into the Chromebook once your son or daughter logs in. As soon as you sign in with their Google account, it will automatically log them into everything on the Chromebook, which is another big advantage for us in education because teachers aren't wasting time trying to have them log into a million different things. They log in, they're in there for all those different Google products as well as some other things. If you are not on a Chromebook, you're gonna wanna do the following. So you're gonna wanna go onto the internet and go to google.com. And you should get a screen that looks similar to my screenshot that's up there. So if you're on a laptop, not on a Chromebook, Once you get to Google, and if you're not on a Chromebook, uh, let me know if, you, if I'm going too fast. If you click on Gmail, it should give you a screen to log in. Now, if you are on your own account and already logged in, you may need to go up and add a user. And if you need help doing that, let me know. So you may want to open up another tab if you want to try to log in as your son or daughter. All right. You should get the following screen. Your student login, all the students' logins are first name dot last name at gostangs.org. First name dot last name at gostangs.org. Does everybody have the email if you need it? The password is. Did I say this backwards? Yeah, GM code. GM, and then their lunch code or their six digit code that they've had 
as long as they've been at Governor Mifflin. And if you don't know that, you may want to text them quick or... Are we logged in? So if you go back to Google. So I have your inbox. So yeah, because you clicked on mail to log in. So if you just go back up to the top and type google.com again, just to get back to this screen, your top right hand corner now of your internet, you should see Gmail, images, the really cool button. Does anybody have a, a clever name for this button? So this button right here is the apps button. All right. Some of our kids like to call it the Rubik's cube. Some of them like to call it the waffle. All right. Um, but the apps button. If you click on the apps button, it's going to show you a list of the apps that they have available to them. All right, so basic set of apps that are available to them, and we'll break down through some of these other different things. This is also the navigation of where you would want to go anytime you're trying to get to a tool. So the, the slide I had up there was called Drive. So this is the symbol for Drive. Drive is kind of the base area of Google Tools. It is your storage area. So you can compare Drive to your My Documents folder on a laptop or your desktop, which a lot of you might just save your stuff to your desktop on your computer at home. All right. Uh, if you work for a company, you might have a network drive where you save stuff. So Google Drive is the online storage area for all files Google, or any file that your student would have. So if you want to see anything your kid has ever done in Google, since they've been a student at Governor Mifflin and using Google products, you can click on Drive. So go ahead and click on Google Drive. Um, the app button, and then the try. So once you clicked on it, you should see a whole bunch of different files that you can scroll down through. And just in perspective, you can use Google, you know, how many people have a Gmail at home? Do have a personal Gmail? All right, so any of these things we talked about tonight, you could use at home personally. Um, any student from sixth through 12th grade can share files outside of the domain. So if you wanted to share a Google Doc, so last night my daughter jumped on my account and recorded shared her Christmas list with my mom. So a 
course, created a whole other set of problems for me. Because her trying to access the Google Doc on her cell phone uh, was just fun. But she finally got it open and she learned. All right? So any of these files could be shared. You can share files with your, uh, your son or daughter or any of the students. They can share work with you. So many times my daughter has also shared a file with me and said, Dad, can you proofread this for me? You know, it's due tomorrow. So they can share that to your personal Gmail account. So what you have here are all these different files. If I wanted to open one up, I could find one. Uh, so here is being a Google Parent newsletter. All right, so this was kind of that newsletter fire flyer that was created in Docs that Mr. Murray gave me and said, does this sound okay? All right, or wherever it came from. I don't know, Chris created it, Steve created it, whatever it may be. The advantage of a Google Doc file and all of these different Google files are now the ability for all of us to edit this file at the same time together at different times, wherever it may be. So if you're ever at, in, in one of those email loops of uh, being sent to like six different people and saying, hey, can you check this Word file and make changes to it? And then one person would email it to the next person who would email it to the next person, and then it would finally get back to you, all right? The Google Doc would allow us to all edit this at the same time. So any change I make here, Steve would see on his computer at the exact same time, all right? Chris, did you have access to this or no? Did you just create it? No. You. No, I, but I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. That's the problem is I make this stuff and then like I'll send things out and people will go, I can't see it. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I, I have no idea what I'm doing. So we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about sharing. We'll talk about sharing I in a minute. I, I can't get to where you are now on the phone. On the phone? Yeah. You're gonna, it's going to be a little different on a phone okay. to, to get in there okay. is easy. Because you need like the drive app you need on the cell phone. Okay. Can I add something? Yeah. Kids will always, just like we found ways, even without electronics at the time, yeah. right? They will find ways as Passing well. Notes. Passing notes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I learned Mark's code just going to pass <laughs> I lie. I wish. but so, so you have your drive. You have all that main storage area. As a school, your student has unlimited space on drive. So they don't have to worry about how much stuff they save on there. Everything is backed up. Um, you know, people ask me all the time about, like, what if Google servers crash, all right? Apple buys space from Google on their servers, so I think they're pretty confident in the security of those servers, all right? It's also one of the only major companies who has not been hacked yet, so, like, you haven't read stories about people's photos being taken off Google Photos, like all the celebrities who have had them taken off Apple. And I'm not bashing Apple by any means. I mean, I have an iPhone in my pocket yet. And I have an iPad, you know, so I still use everything, all right? Um, but Google becomes more about the product, not about the device, all right? Which, as we were talking about earlier, Apple likes to try to lock you into their device. Google's kind of getting there as well, but not to the same extent. So what we have in schools are G Suites for Education. All this stuff is free to the students. Um, Google has sworn that all data for students is completely private. So it is not being sold like our information is, all right? Um, but by being in a student account, that information is only able to be shared with the school, all right, if the school requests that information, all right? Um, so just giving you some background on that, and there is all kinds of language out there on that. So with that, you have this whole suite of products that we'll continue to talk about. So going across here, we have a Google Doc, which is like a Microsoft Word file, all right? But picture Word 97, like going back to the file menus, all right, old school, which I kind of love. It's not a desktop publishing program like Microsoft Word is now. It's not designed to look really pretty. 
It's designed to get together with somebody else and collaborate and work no matter where you are in the world. All right, whether we're sitting next to each other or you know beyond. The next file is a Google slideshow, which is just like a PowerPoint. All right, Google Sheets, just like Excel, and then Google Forms, which some of you could possibly fall in love with. You probably all have seen Google Forms now. All right, is that little question that comes to you like a survey monkey almost, where you're answering questions online and it's submitting answers to whoever sent that form to you. All right, so Steve has sent some out, you know, requesting information about things kids might be interested in or things that you would be interested in as a parent. All right. Is that the same with thought, thought exchange is completely different. Okay. That's that's more of like uh, grabbing big ideas. Okay. So form. Form would be like me handing each of you a piece of paper saying answer these 10 questions, me getting all those pieces of paper back and then like going through each question and marking it off. It's just doing electronically and put them all on a spreadsheet that we can look through. Uh, so like I'll send a form to every single student in the district to get, or the high school, we're gonna do student day of choice. We'll have all the kids pick their sessions. So I'll have 15 different responses instead of the old days where we would have each kid like hand in a slip of paper like this is what I want for that and then somebody would have to sit there and go through 1,500 sheets of paper and mark off, you know, a tally total, so. All right, so if you would like to, to follow along here, if you go back to the slideshow to this slide, so up on top you should have your tabs. If you click on the Google Doc file, so click on the blue symbol, that will take you to a Google Doc. Which all of us can see, all right? So right now it's blank, right? Everybody find it? So right now it's blank. And you only have viewing rights. So with a Google file, we have the ability, or you have the ability, your students have the ability to create a file and share it with whoever they want. So right now I have this shared with anyone in the world but you. Alright? If I'm on Google Docs on my phone, I can start to type on my phone, and it's going to automatically show up on that dock because the dock I have on here is the same dock that I have up there. All right. So this is where our kids, whether we want to admit it or not, are working on stuff together at home. Some teachers might get upset about that. I kind of get excited about that because that is what they're going to need to be able to do in the real world when they get old. Right? So how do we leverage that? And just like you understand their growing pains, we understand that they're growing pains with our teachers as well. And moving in that direction is going to be challenging sometimes. Should all files be that way? No. All right? But in some situations, we should have that ability to do that. All right? So now, go ahead. that they've been shared? Or collaborated. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I'll show you that in one second after we go through and, and edit this. All right. So I am going to change the sharing rights of this file. All right. Yes, yes, view only. So I went on my phone, on my personal account, and I just changed this to anyone in the world can edit. If I refresh this document, and you refresh the document in front of you, that view only symbol should go away. How do you refresh uh, Click the circular arrow at the top of your screen, or on the Chromebook, it's even, there's even a symbol on the Chromebook. Right here, that you can do. Oh, okay. So if you refresh that page, is it giving you edit it rights, or am I modeling failure? Okay. It now gives you the ability to start typing on that. All right. So do me a favor. Let's um. 
Let's type your favorite restaurant. So go ahead and type your favorite restaurant. Nobody's screaming at each other yet. That's good. Even though you're typing in the middle of yourself sometimes. <laughs> Self-regulating and figuring it out. So any of the Google products that are out there give you the ability to share this file. All right? So you can share it in three different ways. You notice I shared it with you view only to begin with. So if you want to share a file with somebody and just say, I want you to see this and that's it, you share it with them as view only. For me to share, you'll notice there's a large share button in the top right hand corner. I click on share. And then from here, I can either use sharing of the link, so I have a link that I want to share, and I can say anyone can edit, anyone can comment, anyone can view. So anyone can comment means they can only add comments to the side, they can't change what the actual file looks like. Anyone can view means they can only see it and that's it. Does that make sense from the root level? I can also just share it with a person. So if I only wanted Steve and I to have access with this file, if I start typing his name or his email in, I could share it with his email account, and only him and I would have access to that file. Depends. So I can do that. Okay. So when I add somebody, if I add Steve Murray, and then once I add him, there'll be an option to right here. Uh, where is it at? Steve Murray. If I use his Gmail. Once he's in there, I can then change the settings of, like I can make his, his sharing expire, okay. or I can say not allowed to share, not allowed to download, not allowed to, whatever. all right. Um, somebody can still take a picture with their cell phone, they can still do any of those different things, but it stops them from sharing. So if I create something, this is probably what I did. You created your own? It was you only, and then I tried to So if we want to create a file, we would do this, all right? So if I go back to my drive, if I have drive open, in the top corner I have a new option. When I click on new, I can create a Google Doc, a Google Sheet, and a Google Slideshow. So this is the start of my activity. I want to create a slideshow. Each of you are going to have your own slide, and you're going to make like a, a thank you for each teacher that your kid has, all right? So I click on a Google Slideshow, it opens up. All right. As of now, I'm the only one that has access to you, has access to this. So what you probably did was copy this link, right, when you created it, put it in an email, and email it to everybody. Okay. So when I did that, if I copy that, send it out, you would click on it and it would say, you do not have access to this. All right. And that's like that, you know, that first step of, oh, I forgot to share it. All right. 
And that's where I model failure sometimes. Ha ha, just forget that you share. When I do sessions like this, I'm like, oh, go to the link. And they're like, uh, we don't have access. Because I need to then go up and click on share. So when I'm ready to share this, I want to give this to each of you. I click share. All right. I need to name it. Hit save. And then I now have the ability to start adding people. All right. So if I start typing a name in, all right, I can start to look for different ones. Okay, I'll see. C A R Y N. Okay. All right, so like I start to type Karen because she has a Ghost Dang account. It shows Karen Freelander. I can click on that and I could now share that only with Karen. I could type every one of your email addresses in that each of you would have access to it. Yeah, so you can go to like Google Contacts and create a group. Correct, yeah. Um, and that's where class, Classroom for teachers is great. Like if you're looking to do it in that way, you can create a Google Classroom and then it automatically shares those things to that, for the students in that class. All right. if they have editing rights? Yeah. yeah. So I can, again, I can send it to Karen individually, or I can come up here where it says get shareable link, and then I can say anyone with this link can view. Send it then in an email, and that's what you need to do, Chris, if you want them to be able to view it. Send that link now in an email if anyone can view, and then anyone would have the internet or be able to view. So, so let's say you send it to my Yahoo account, and I click, I, I go to click on it, and then I'm not allowed to view it. You can view it um, if it's view only. You'd be able to view it without an account. However, it's going to ask you to like create an account and go through it. Yeah. So, so one of the answers to that, and this is getting way deeper than we want to get, but <laughs> if you go to file publish to the web, like it'll actually publish this site to the web, that it's almost a website. So the slideshow that I shared with you, this is the actual slideshow. You'll notice that none of you have slides on the left. You're not able to see it like it's in PowerPoint or Google Slides. You're seeing the published version, all right, which looks like that. The published version, anyone can get to without a problem. It's just a live website. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. So I created that file. I shared it. If I um, if I give someone inter if I give someone ability to edit it, you may want to make a copy of it if it's going to be your own. So I don't think this affects you guys a lot, but Skeet right away was like, as a teacher, I share my work with other teachers, and then all of a sudden they start messing with my work, and now it's not the same as it was because everyone has editing rights to that, I or the teachers he shared it with. I made a mistake about a year ago where a new teacher joined the district. My lesson plan format with them. And I put it out there, I said, just make a copy. They did not make a copy. So the whole thing was transformed. So I just had to keep going back and clicking and finding <laughs> overriding what she did. So the heck my original format. So what he was saying about that is another tool that's great for for teachers and could be great for parents if you want to kind of see your students' process. All right. So there's an option in Google Docs called Re Revision History, and this is all Google files. So if I come up here to where it says last edited, you guys see where it says that? Last edited eight minutes ago. If I click on that option, this is going to show me all the revisions that occurred to this document. All right? And this is where teachers will go sometimes to see, all right, how many times, <coughs> excuse me, how many times did a student revise their work? Right? And if you think about a good essay, a good essay that's like two pages has typically been typed slash revised around 2,000 times. All right? So if a teacher sees five on there, what's probably the culprit of a reason it has five on there? They haven't done their work. They haven't done their work. Or somebody else it. Or somehow along the line, something got copy and pasted into that document. 
All right. Whether it was because they decided to type it on Microsoft first and then copy and paste it into, Word, into Google Docs, all right, or not, somehow a large chunk of information got pasted into that doc. All right? But as we were saying, the good thing about this is I can then go back and see what different revisions happen. So at this time, you know, there's different edits. If I start to go through, I can see those different edits who made the different edits at what time, and I continue to go back and back and back and back till it's a blank document again with nothing on it. All right. So it gives you the power to kind of see what you know work your student did. All right. If you're going to check on some work that they were doing, and again, I'm not just using it as an I gotcha. I tell teachers all the time, it's good to see their thought process when they created that. Did they type it out and then go back and revise it, or were they typing, going back and revising, typing, going back and revising? Right, where we know it's best to get your thoughts down and then go back and continue to revise it over and over again all right, to get that best final product. So that's the revision history and version history in there. Um, that version history, the sharing, all of those different things work the same in every different Google process. So no matter what you're using, all of that's going to work the same as you go through. Questions on creating a document? So we went to Drive, we clicked on New, all right, and then we picked whatever type of file we wanted. To Share, we went up to the Share button, clicked on Share, and then shared out all that different stuff. There are a lot of different features in here that I really love, like typing. So on any Google Doc, if I go up to Insert, <coughs> or excuse me, uh, Tools, Voice Typing, After I hit allow, it's just going to start to listen and type what I say, period, new paragraph. It's actually gotten pretty good and gets better as you use it because it learns your voice. Exclamation point, new paragraph. So if your son or daughter breaks their arm and says they can't do their work, <laughs> you could now have them voice type it. And they're hating me more and more as the time goes on. <laughs> That it, it's not perfect, but it works pretty well. Like it, yeah. All right. What's that? So we're like <laughs> it <anymore. laughs> um, and look, I'll be honest, I use this sometimes too, instead of typing, just like I do on my phone. There'll be times where I'm like, I just don't feel like typing right now. I'm going to use my voice typing. All right. Do go back and proofread. All right. Just like I sent a, a text to Melissa Fullerton today as I was driving, and she texted me back, and she's like, Are you okay? Because I didn't listen to what it said. and it came across just completely different. So. <laughs> Somebody else is playing with voice typing because it hurt me in type. All right. Um, so breaking down those different tools as we go through, you know, looking at the different ones um, as you go. So the other thing that came along then that you probably hear a lot about is Google Classroom. Uh, Google Classroom is the platform that allows you or allows teachers to distribute work to students and collect it back really easily. So back in the day when I was in the classroom, long, long time, no, okay. not that long ago, Google Classroom's been out about six years now. Before that, my kids would do exactly what I just did. They would create a file, they would share it with me. When they share it with me, an email was sent to me. So as a teacher, I had 150 different students at one time. They would create a file, they would share it with me, I would get an email with them sharing it to me that I would then have to move in. Steve, all right, I got one. Thank you. Um, I would then have to go through all those emails. That's on top of getting emails from my principal, on top of getting emails from parents. All these different things. The other thing is I would sit down on Sunday because it's the best time in the world to grade because I'm sitting there watching football and like grading students' work. And 50% of them would be like, you didn't share this with them. You know, I, I don't have access. All right, we had a kid who was second in our class at Wilson stand up in front of a bunch of teachers who were there for a site visit and say, I love Google Docs. I can I kind of cheat and send it to my teacher the wrong way, and then I end up getting an extra day to work on it because they don't realize that I didn't share it the correct way. All right? So smart kids just as much understand how to <laughs> bend the rules all right, to an extent. So Classroom kind of took that away because it automatically shares that file with the kid, and the teacher automatically has access to it right away. 
So as soon as I assign work to my students, I have access, they have access, I can see them working on it or not working on it, all right, and check in on them even if I'm not sitting next to them in the classroom, all right, which is a nice feature. If you want to see what classroom looks like from the student perspective, if you go back to that apps button, it looks like a chalkboard, which most of you will understand, but most of our kids do not, with like a little silhouette of a person in front of it. different classes that are in my account. If you get to your students, So what it will look like this, this is their classes, all right? I will tell you right away that unless you log in as your student, unless you log in as your student, you will not have access to their Google Classroom, all right? So when Google created Google Classroom, they wanted it to be protected from outside harm, all right? Good, bad, or indifferent. So you will not be able to get to this area of your student's Google Classroom unless you log in as them, all right? I, is this is where homework is? This is where homework would so possibly be. If a parent wants to check whether their child's doing their homework, yeah. they need so, to be in there. So system. Steve can kind of talk about that. I mean, every teacher is supposed to have a digital workflow in the high school that they you would be able to see what they're supposed to be doing each day. Okay. Whether it's like paper-based or not paper-based, uh, most of it's digital files and it's on Google Classroom, but it should have some type of landing spot of you know, maybe even this is what we're doing this week, or this is what, you know, is happening as like a, as a check-in. I, I know I get emails about the week before. Do you guys get I'll, I'll talk. I'll talk about that in, in a second. But I don't so. get anything about what's happening currently. About what's upcoming? What's due. Right. Okay. So that might be an email we need to send out as a reminder. Mm -hmm. All right. So on Google Classroom, you'll notice that this is one that Steve had created for the high school, so for faculty meetings, you know, as a good leader does, it's modeling to the teachers and posting work on there, like the faculty meeting agenda for tomorrow. So the teachers can go on to Google Classroom and see what the agenda is for tomorrow's faculty meeting. All right, just like we want our students to go on and be able to see what's there as well. As we go through, um, you can kind of see some of the different things that are there, a date that it's due, or a date that it was assigned, whatever it may be, going down the road. Does everybody see where to get to that? Everybody got to it right? Go on the apps button, clicking on classroom. So the other aspect of Google Classroom, and the only thing really for parents to get are the Guardian summaries, all right? Um, which, as a parent, I'm not in love with, and I know some of you are expressing, you know, not concerned or not necessarily super happy with that as well. Um, this is basically where it's at right now. So what you would see is missing from last week, all right? And then this is one uh, due next week. So depending on how far ahead the teachers have assigned stuff, you know, that's the other thing that it comes down to, all right? So sometimes teachers are, you know, fighting be a week ahead you know, to begin with, all right? So when they post it on there, it would show up if it was due next week. Now I will say, you can change your weekly summaries to daily summaries if you would like. So like for Bella, I have it as daily summaries. So every day at like five o'clock or 4.30, I get an email saying like, what was due that day, what's due coming up, if she's missing anything, whatever it may be. What's that? So there is a link here to go to Guardian Summaries. And then if you scroll down through, there's an option for your settings. Like it talks about 
start receiving email summaries, and we'll give you the breakdown of what that looks like. And where is that link normally in the weekly summary? Uh, yeah, at the bottom, I think it says edit your notifications. I can look at Bell a little bit. bad kid. So down at the bottom, so this is what the summary looks like. If I go down to the bottom, it gives me an option to for settings or unsubscribe. And if I click on settings from there, uh, it's going to ask how often, how frequently I want it. So right here is daily, weekly, or no summaries. An invitation should get to you. Um, if it has not gotten to you or if you never signed up for it and it expired, you can email one of your son or daughter's teachers and they can add you as a guardian to Google Classroom. As soon as they add you and add your email as a guardian, it will send you the email saying, do you want to set up notifications? And then that sets it up for everything for like ever? That sets it up for everything forever. Okay. Yeah. So one of the nice things for the teachers is they don't have to add every single parent for every single class. Um, I think the intermediate school at one time was adding like all the parents or maybe the middle school, whatever it was. And then, so all the parents were added at one point in time. So, and there is now, uh, Google Classroom is now starting to connect with Skyward. So as of now, you might see a discrepancy between Google Classroom and Skyward because they're not really connecting. And for us to say to the teachers, like, we want you to put grades in in Google Classroom and put grades in in Skyward, is kind of silly to me for them to waste their time doing that. So go by Skyward grades over Google Classroom grades. By far, Skyward would be the one to check. Um, and there is a connection starting to occur that the grades will automatically go from Google Classroom to Skyward, in which case it's a lot more teachers will be doing grading on Google Classroom because it will automatically go to Skyward. That makes sense. Sorry, an hour is really quick. I'm trying to like throw as much at you as I can. Hopefully not overwhelming you too much. So questions on Google Classroom. So really quick, Gmail, Calendar, Google Keep, um, just a couple other Google tools. Your students have access to all of these. Um, I actually absolutely love Google Keep. This might be good for some of you as well. So it links out as well if you clicked on the symbol. But this gives me all these different post-it notes. It's almost like Wonderlist if you ever use Wonderlist. Um, I have it on my phone. I can share notes with other people. I'm a checklist person, so you'll notice right now like some of my school checklist stuff, all right? Reach out to Google programming course, read four o'clock faculty, all right? Um, I check these off when I'm done with them, they go away. It's a nice way for me to keep track of tasks. If your student is struggling with like, what do I need to do? You could possibly recommend using Google Keep as a way for them to create lists of things they need to do, all right? I also have a Christmas list on here or somewhere of what I need to, to buy my lovely wife so that I can check it off. And as she like drops subtle hints or smacks me in the back of the head and say, buy me this, I can type it in my Google Keep real quick so I have it, all right? So that was Google Keep. Um, the other thing is I think our students really do not leverage their Google calendars enough. So as a parent, feel free to advocate to them to use their calendar, all right, um, as they're going through. So some other products they can check out. So Skyward, Family Access Center, um, how many people have been on it? Has anybody not been on Skyward Access at all? So you have not been on at all? All right. So if you go to the Governor Mifflin website, down at the bottom, I know it doesn't make sense, but this will get you there. If you click on Skyward Back to School Update, it actually takes you to the Skyward Student Center. All right. So if I were to go to the Governor Mifflin website and click on that, it's going to give me this screen, Student Information System. All of you were sent a letter at some point in time with login information. 
I'm going to be honest, because I had access, I had never done it at the beginning of the year, which was kind of nice, because I have no idea where that got, letter got to. So if any of you are in that boat and have no clue what happens, I'm going to tell you what I did six hours ago to figure out exactly what this looked like for the parent who threw the letter away, or we'll just claim it never came to our house. <laughs> All right. So when I clicked on that back to school link, it opened up the login screen. I clicked on forgot or lost password. I then went through all of my other emails other than school until it found my rickervb at gmail account, which is obviously what I signed up for during back to school paperwork. What is that called this year? It's not InfoSnap this year, it was drawing a black. What's that? It was through Skyward this year, whatever it was. But at the beginning of the year, to get your student schedule, which is that like dangling the carrot, right. that if you don't fill this out, your student's not going to see their schedule, you filled it out, put an email in there most likely. I basically kept guessing, it found the right one and said an email was sent to your email account. Okay? I still didn't solve the password problem. So once I got that on that email, which I might still have, On the email at the bottom, it said change your password. Which I could click on that link then and set up a whole new password. So I figured out my email by testing them and finally getting the one that said yes, an email has been sent. I got my password by just resetting. All right. Once I was done, then I could log in and see the following thing. So this was that forgot lost password. All right, so I have screenshots on there if you want to go through it then. Once I'm in, this is what the screen looks like. So it's Family Access Center. All right, notice I have both of my children, so I won't see anything unless I click the down arrow and pick which child I want to click on. All right, I probably should not be doing this session because I have not checked my students' work all year. Okay, that's a blessing in my mind just because I haven't had a but I should still be doing it. So I pick the student that I want, and then it breaks down all of their different things. So this is the first screen that pops up. All right? Each class, when I clicked on grade book on the left, each class going down through has A minus, A, B, C, C plus, whatever it may be. And that's all it really shows on this screen. If I click on display options right here, it's going to show me, I can either view all grades, show current grades only, or show previous and current grades. It's still only showing letter grades. Everybody with me so far? If I then click on one of these grades, so if I want to see all the assignments for APUSH, if I click on that grade percentage or grade letter, so if I click on the A minus there, it pops out this screen, which has all of the work that's in there in grades. Okay? It also has, which Val just told me this was like new, the score percentage, because I think there was some. We just updated that. Yeah. A couple weeks ago. Like we didn't realize it wasn't turned on. And Kids couldn't see their actual grades, so they're like, I have an A minus, how close am I to an A? Like, what do I need to do? All right, so that was now turned on, and you can see that percentage. That is kind of, I think, what you're thinking about, where each assignment's listed. Right, and you can see if it's missing or if it's completed. Yeah. Right. Yep, and that's, that's what you're asking, right? Yeah. Okay. So again, I went, I logged in, I clicked on grades, and then I clicked on one of the letter grades and it popped out that full description of that course. Okay. Um, attendance is on there, so as I'm going down the left, I can click on attendance and check attendance. All right, and see like absent, not absent, whatever it may be. I have food services, so whether you know this or not, you can go on there and check what the balance is. You can see what they bought as far as did they buy a meal, did they buy a snack, 
Are all they're buying is snacks? Are they buying $15 worth of snacks a day and not getting a meal? All right, and you can choose to use that however you want, but it's there. So you can see that, you know, Bella did not buy it all this week, all right, because she packed that week. So I can kind of go through that and see, and I did go back and see some of the stuff she purchased in the past weeks. The other thing is Sky Alerts. Uh, if you click on Sky Alerts on the left, you can turn on alerts. So if they are not, or if they're marked as absent from school by, do you know what time it is? It's around 940-ish. 9.40, all right? Depending on what alert you would have on, you could get a text, you could get an email, all right? Um, notifying you that they were marked as absent in school, all right? People make mistakes. Hopefully it doesn't happen a lot. Hopefully they are in school if you got that message or you just go, oh crap, I forgot to call, and they're home sick. Um, the other thing within Skyward then is the app push and notification. So there is an app that you can download on your phone and you can turn on notifications through that as well. Yeah. I'll be honest, I don't really use it. I, I don't know if you guys use it, but uh, you have it just because um, with Skyward and the fact that I'm on a Chromebook all day, I'm not really that worried about it because I'm seeing my email constantly. So I don't really feel like I need another app on my phone. But this links out, if you click on that picture, that will link out to the page on the app and all the information about setting up the app. Yeah, please. Actually, a checkbox for a teacher that it tells you assignments as many as it might be. Assignments are missing in that email, but when I check with the kids, it's not missing. It just hasn't been put in yet. Yeah, so so one of the one of the things about Google Classroom is if a teacher assigns an assignment that a kid's not necessarily handing in, um, if they if the teacher doesn't remember to go in and check all is done, or the student doesn't just go on and mark it as done, it will show up as missing. Um, so it's not a perfect scenario. Uh, look, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir with this crowd because the fact that you're here says a lot about you know you being concerned you know for your kids, right? But the best thing you can do is sit down with them and say, show me what you did, show me why this is missing, right? Show me your work. If you can find time, if they'll do it, right? If they'll do it. You know what she tells me? Oh, really? So, so hopefully that helps a little bit. Talking about schoolies, off the list, we've got it all taken care of. So hopefully now you can at least ask, so I was looking at your classroom today and this assignment's missing, why? I really, you know what I really miss? Well, the interaction, but the paper, the physical paper, and even the little thing and the report card that's tangible, that you can take it home and say, look what I did. So if if, if you doing well, if you good. if you open up the Google Doc, uh -huh. there should be comments on there if they're grading on a Google Doc. Um, if you go in a classroom, there will be private comments that are sent back to the kids with those comments on. So if you're 
So, so like where I showed you to go in Google Classroom, if you click on one of the assignments. Okay, but that would be individual assignments, not generally classroom the assignments, right? Yeah, yeah that would just be per individual assignment. Okay. Yeah. And <coughs> assignment, and then you'll see. So it'll be like comments? private comments. Those would be his comments on the Google Doc, like whatever work they're doing. Correct. So if you go to her drive and click on the Google Doc assignment, that would show all that work. Or if you go into classroom and click on the assignment, it'll show the link to her Google Doc. You would click on that Google Doc and it would open. So, so the other thing is this, guys, please, like, again, my goal is to support students, but that also means supporting you. So if you have questions, feel free to email me. Um, now, granted, look, the students come first and my teachers come first, so if I don't get back to you in 24 hours, because I try to get back to my teachers in 24 hours, and, you know, that's kind of my goal, um, I will get back to you at some point and do whatever I can to help you out. And there's a lot of tutorials out there, you know, so if you're looking at creating a Google Doc. You know, you can just Google search, you know, how do I create a Google Doc? Or how do I add comments to a Google Doc? Or email me and I can 